and welcome to the ninth episode of Talk Wildlife. Today we're going to be talking about the importance of parasites, a topic that I hope you'll find very interesting and one that's been really fun to research and really interesting as well. Although I studied parasites a little bit at uni, I didn't study them enough to be doing this podcast episode without doing a lot of research, so I really, really enjoyed looking into it. Anyway, let's talk wildlife. So when I had the idea of doing this podcast, I really wanted to talk about the fact that parasites aren't all bad, and there are many that live within us which we don't even know we have, which is a bit scary, but also very interesting. I wouldn't expect that myself, Kevin, or you at home will finish talking about or listening to this episode suddenly thinking, oh, I really want my dog to get fleas or ticks. I love parasites, they make the world amazing. We're not expecting that. But I'll attempt to answer some questions about whether or not the world would be a better place without them, and also if they do play a big enough part for them to be worth existing at all. So here's a couple of facts about parasites to start off with. Parasites are believed to make up around 40% of the species living on the planet, which makes sense if you think about it, because pretty much every species out there has a parasite that goes with it. There are more than 2,380 flea species worldwide, and fleas can even be parasitised themselves by mites. In fact, fleas have been found hosting 150 individual mites each. Now, I chose the word important on purpose, and that's because important does not necessarily mean good, just that they play a really big part in our ecosystems and in life as a whole. They're obviously really bad. Parasites cause things like dengue fever, lymphatic filariasis, elephantiasis, malaria, smallpox. Protozoa and other human parasites are considered to be responsible for more deaths than wars and famine combined. And Plasmodium is the most dangerous protozoa being responsible for malaria, which kills up to 2.7 million people a year. And as we all know, parasites are known to be uncomfortable and unpleasant to remove. Let's talk about a really, really common parasite, which actually, apparently, a lot of us may be infected with and have no idea. That's toxoplasmosis. So, Kev, what have you found out about toxoplasmosis for this par- for this? I know it's a parasite there. What have you found out about toxoplasmosis for this podcast episode? Well, I think um, what Flo's trying to say here is that she thinks I'm a parasite. Well, yeah. Probably, probably full of them, but hey. I mean, humans are parasites by definition, and in fact, <coughs> I'm going to talk about that a bit more later on. So, what is toxoplasmosis? It is an infection caused by a single cell parasite called Toxoplasma gondii. It is usually harmless, but in some people it can cause really serious problems. So, how do humans get it? It's actually a part of a wider cycle involving cats and rats and the food people eat. Humans can get the infection from several sources, but one of the main ones are from eating contaminated food from farm animals who themselves are infected or from coming into contact with infected faeces from an infected animal like a pet cat. This can be from simply cleaning out a litter tray or not washing your hands and then touching your face. Now you might not even know that you even have the parasite and it's living in you and living its life cycle through you. You might not even know some people it doesn't affect at all. And it's pretty common in people, isn't it? Yes, it is really common in people. So the percentage of humans that have toxoplasmosis. In some countries, there are estimates are up to 80% of the population may be infected, depending on their eating habits and if they have any contact with cats. Wow, 80 as in 80. As in 80 in some countries. Global estimates think one third of the 7.2 billion people in the world may have been infected and could potentially be sharing their brain with a parasite. So going back to the cycle of the parasite itself, and I said you can catch it even just from your pet cat. Other ways it can spread to humans though can be through blood transfusions or organ donations which have come from people who are already infected. And there are other ways people can get the infection too, from water and even vegetables. So really, you can get it from eating meats, you can get it from water, you can get it from your pet cat, you can get it from vegetables, and they think in some countries only 80% have it. I would wonder if that's a lot, lot higher than 80%. I did a little project on toxoplasmosis in uni, 
and I'm trying to remember how to avoid it, but it was just it was quite simple things like washing vegetables, basic hygiene, using gloves to change litter trays, and there was a big bit about pregnant people avoiding any potential source, for example, their cats and cleaning out litter trays as well. Um, did you find out about that? Because I believe that it can be really harmful to fetuses, even though it's less harmful to adults or even children. I did come across a few studies where it did say it was dangerous to pregnant people and their fetuses. Um, but that's not the area I kind of focused in on when I was looking at the harm to human health. The infection is not noticed by most people and it does not harm the majority of people. But in some cases, if left untreated long enough, chronic effects happen when the cysts spread to the brain and muscles and they can stay there as long as a person lives. So you can have this parasite potentially in your brain your whole life. It's not unusual for foxes to come into captivity which actually have toxoplasmosis and this can actually mean they can't be released because it alters their brain as well and it often makes them act as if they're tame or at least not quite as wild as you'd expect. Well, in humans, in very rare cases, these cysts, when they're in the brain, can rupture and cause severe illness. So it can cause brain damage and it can even damage your eyes and other vital organs in your body. That's terrifying. Now, it's not the parasite's goal to do that. The parasite wants you to be alive so it can keep reproducing and spreading its infection and spreading the parasite and increasing that cycle. So it doesn't want you to be ill. See, cats can get it via the wildlife they predate, like rats and birds, who in turn can pick it up from contaminated soils. So there are many ways it can get passed around the ecosystem. Cats then can shed millions of parasites in their faeces, and rats get it in the very same way through cat faeces and contaminated land. The University of California, Berkeley, did some research on how toxoplasmosis affects mice and rats. And the early studies have found that when the parasite infects mice and rats, it changes their brain behaviour and makes them become attracted to cat urine and then therefore increasing the risk of being predated by the cat and passing the parasite back onto the cat. I've heard some jokes that people who love cats and have loads of cats themselves are infected with toxoplasmosis and that's why they hoard cats. I think that's a myth, but maybe there's some truth in it. So if you love your cat, you might not actually really love your cat. The Aww, parasite. No, in your... it's more just if you kind of collect lots of cats. Maybe. The parasite in your brain may be telling you you love cats just to keep the cycle going. Ever think of that? When I studied it before, though, I found other scary things. For example, people who have toxoplasmosis are slightly more likely to get into car accidents and things like that. So going back to the, the rats and mice, just think how amazing that this parasite gets into their brain... And they'd normally stay away from any signs of cats at all. Yet this parasite switches something on in their brain which exposes them to be getting caught and killed, which is absolutely crazy. It's like, and I think it takes roughly about three weeks, that parasite, to turn that switch in that rat or that mouse's brain. In one study in the Czech Republic, men with toxoplasmosis showed lower superego strength and higher vigilance, and therefore men were more likely to disregard rules and were more suspicious, jealous and dogmatic. So like the mice and the rats, it changed brain function and behaviour. And as for women, it made them more warm-hearted, outgoing, conscientious, persistent and moralistic. Funny how the effects are pretty different. If it's the same way that it does it to the rats and mice, it wants them to be able to pass it on. How is it achieving that differently through male and female humans? I mean, angry men will go and challenge the rats to a duel and friendly women will go and adopt the rats as pets. I think the friendly women, <laughs> I mean, the friendly women are more likely to go and hug a cat. Mm, <laughs> Pass it back round. An, an angry man is going to angrily hug a cat. In a study in Korea, it showed that being infected does present the question that it may have a link between the infection and higher suicide rates in people who have toxoplasmosis. Wow. That just goes to show that a parasite, which a lot of people don't necessarily know about or know how prevalent it is, can have such a big effect on people. So Flo, what have you learned about parasites? 
Well, I want to talk about the effects on animals and animal populations in two different senses, directly and indirectly. And this is all to link back to the importance of parasites. So first of all, parasites influence host behaviour and fitness, which we've talked about with toxoplasmosis, for example, and people being more likely to act in certain ways or animals being more likely to act in certain ways as a result of being infected by the parasite. It can regulate host population sizes with sometimes profound effects on trophic interactions, food webs, competition, biodiversity and even keystone species. So the effects are more wide reaching than may obviously meet the eye at the beginning. And it's suggested therefore that parasites are an integral part of our ecosystem and community structures. They also act as both predators and prey. For example, one study found that predators on islands in the Gulf of California, such as scorpions, lizards and spiders, are one to two orders of magnitude more abundant on the islands which have seabird colonies. And that is because they feed on the birds' external parasites. And in a study in 2007 in sharks, they found that a type of tapeworm, Anthobothrium, as well as Paraerygmatobothrium, which both feed on the nutrients in sharks' guts, actually absorbed a lot of the toxic metal which was ingested by the sharks, so that 278 to 455 times as much cadmium and lead were found in these parasites as in the sharks. So that really helped the sharks as they absorbed the toxic elements into themselves. There are many species out there which are parasites, which you might not actually think of as parasites. For example, Herring gulls, or all gulls really, although to be fair a lot of people do see them as parasites, but also species of penguins, whales and even humans take part in parasitism, and that is kleptoparasitism, the act of stealing another's food. Whales, for example, steal food from nets of fishermen, and humans eat honey, which is food which is created by bees, and that is a prime example of kleptoparasitism. And so you can say, as I said earlier, that humans are also parasites. Now I'd like to talk about the effects on animals indirectly. So that was direct effects, this is indirect effects. Every year, the trade of endangered species is a problem worldwide, with thousands of illegal transactions taking place. There are species protected by the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. And when animals which are on this protection list are found by the authorities, investigations go into where exactly these animals came from and who it is that broke the law when it came to moving them. Now, believe it or not, parasites can actually be used to point the blame. And that's because parasites often live in very specific parts of the world, which can help the authorities to track down exactly where the animal which they are on came from. They found on a pet chameleon when it had died a parasite which only exists in Madagascar so they were able to trace back that chameleon as having illegally come from Madagascar even though the dealer said that it had come from somewhere else entirely so then they found out the dealer had actually broken the law by supplying this animal from Madagascar. So parasites are not all that bad if it can help us unravel the illegal wildlife trade? Well they certainly help us with the detective work. So now onto the environment. Parasites are a natural pest control. Oh, I've got a really good one for this. So, the parasitic wasp. There are tens of thousands of different parasitic wasp species in the world, and these parasitoid wasps nearly lay all their eggs on or in the body of other insects, which then become the nest chamber for their growing young, who eventually will eat their way out. The larvae eat free the victims, but start with less important organs to keep them alive longer, keeping them fresher. I think that's really clever that a larvae knows which organs it can munch through first of its host without killing them to preserve their meat longer, as to say. Yeah, that is really interesting. And I believe that these parasites are actually used all around the world as a sort of natural pest control. Yeah, some agricultural farms are actually now using parasitic wasps to help control certain crop pests and they're finding that these wasps can really indent on the spread and rise in number of crop pests, showing that they do not affect the crop at all but actually keep the number of the pests down. So what they've been doing is releasing these parasitic wasps, only ones though which target a certain 
insect and it's an insect which feeds on the crop now if left unchecked they can do big damage to the the crop being grown in the field but these wasps will come along and they keep the numbers down and, and it's just basically like a natural pest control i think the best thing about it is that it prevents the necessity of putting down harmful chemicals and therefore killing other animals which may come into contact with them I guess that's true, and that's a positive if they're not using pesticides. But this is not saying they don't use other kind of pesticides as well to treat other kind of things on the crop. So there's lots of different animals these wasps will kill. And it's estimated that almost every pest insect species has a type of parasitic wasp that preys upon them. Their actions help keep the number of garden and crop pests down. So if you're a keen gardener, you're growing your fruits and your veggies, or even just really nice flowers, and you see wasps, and it could just be the common wasp, because they have really good pest control, not parasitic though, right down to your parasitic wasps. They, they are a gardener's friend. You want them in your garden because they will help keep your plants healthy and pest numbers down. There is a parasitic wasp which loves caterpillars, only of a certain species of moth. And what they do is they can find this caterpillar, they search underneath the leaves until they find this caterpillar and they'll paralyze it with a sting. And in one account, it was observed being dragged over 500 meters through grassland, through a cornfield, and then finally down into the hole that it had prepared. Now, when this wasp got to the hole, it removed two chunks of soil it used on top of the hole to cover it, and then dragged down the caterpillar and then entombed it. It came back out, filled in the hole. So what will happen is the larvae inside that caterpillar, when it wakes up, is going to be stuck, but the larvae will hatch out and eat its way out of the caterpillar. For a caterpillar, but that is very clever. I know, and again, you know, maybe that species of caterpillar does a lot of damage to certain plants. So if it weren't for the wasps or these parasites, there might be severe damage to crops or people's gardens. So I know people will wonder what role does parasites play? Even on the smallest level, they're playing their part and they all have to play their part in the ecosystem for it to work. But in true parasite form, it is pretty brutal. But I think it happens in this country, in the UK, happens all the time. And you haven't seen it yet. I know. No one stops long enough to take nature in and get back into the rhythm of nature to see all these things going on. Right beneath your feet, when you're walking out in those fields, in that woodland, even just through the town, there are these little battles going on where these parasites are committing the most heinous crimes to other insects. And you don't even know about it. All these life struggles going on and it's all a part of that ecosystem. I just wanted to do an additional parasite, um, one that we're probably all a bit more aware of, which is brood parasites. Now, in this case, it's the cuckoo. So how many of you people listening actually would have thought a cuckoo is a parasite? Well, they are. Cuckoos are known to be brood parasites and this is when they lay their eggs in the nest of another bird and it's usually of the same or very similar species they choose from some species will lay their eggs only in a certain species nest now with our cuckoo in the uk it's usually either the dunnock or the reed warbler's nest and these cuckoos have thought to seek out a nest with the right type of species egg in them so their eggs can be a little bit different but these eggs are then so they blend in with either the Dunnocks or the reed warblers. And it's really weird because cuckoos are obligate brood parasites, meaning they only reproduce in this way. So they don't, like all the other bird species, they don't breed and reproduce so the same really way. they don't really young themselves? No, they don't really young. It's like the equivalent of putting all your children up for adoption. A family next door has five children and you have a child and you think, well, if I just leave my child in their house one day, they might not notice that there's now six. Yeah, it's the same size as the others, it's fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there's another brood parasite I want to just really touch briefly on, and that's cowbirds. Indigo cowbirds and even ducks, that's a black-headed duck. Most of these target just one species to raise their young, but some cowbirds, especially like the brown-headed cowbird, 
has over 200 known hosts they will use to raise their young. Wow. So they're not picky at all. So that was my uh, one I wanted to add in there. So I, I love birds. Um, I've never seen a cuckoo. I've heard a cuckoo quite recently. Still never seen one in the wild. And I really want to get one next. They're awesome, awesome birds. Um, so Flo, tell us what your next parasite is that you're going to talk about. This isn't really about an individual parasite. I'll be mentioning a few parasites as I go along. But we've talked a bit about the animal world and I'd just like to bring it back to the human world for a bit. Parasites can have positives to health in more ways than one. It's common knowledge that in the past, leeches were used to treat wounds, often unsuccessfully. However, they can be used in reconstructive surgery to control blood flow. And this is done by allowing them to remove the blood into newly attached tissues, which help to save parts of the body which would otherwise die. At Strathclyde University in Glasgow, a team of researchers is experimenting on a protein created by a parasitic worm, and I'm not even going to attempt to say the name, and this is a worm which infects rodents. <coughs> it's suggested in the research that even in the absence of this worm, the protein which is found in the parasite has the ability to reduce allergic inflammation, and I'm going to move on to how this is relevant in humans. There is a hypothesis called the hygiene hypothesis, which says that in early childhood, exposure to particular microorganisms protect us against allergic diseases by contributing to the development of our immune systems. For example, when parasites go into our bodies, maybe tapeworms or roundworms, they give our immune system a boost by triggering it to react. Our immune system then attacks this parasite, which at the same time ensures that the immune system response doesn't get out of hand. This means that when we're affected by a parasite, our immune system is more active than usual, and therefore, if we're affected by something else, our body is quicker to respond to it. Because these parasites make sure that the host immune system doesn't get out of hand, so to speak, it means that people who sometimes suffer with allergies no longer suffer because their immune system is not responding in the same way to these harmless substances. This man in an article I read about called Theo was able to live allergy free for a couple of years because he infected himself with parasites. However, as is often the case, a couple of years later, the parasites emerged from him in what is called a traumatic manner. Uh, so that's the less um, lovely, cushy part of that. Will you tell us this traumatic manner? No, it doesn't mention it, uh, oddly enough. But one study showed that patients infected by helminths experienced fewer symptoms of multiple sclerosis than those who had not been infected. And in a 2008 trial, people were infected with live pig whipworm eggs, and it found that the number of active nerve cell lesions in the brains of patients and their spinal cords was lowered. However, as soon as they stopped taking the parasites, the number of lesions went up again. Other studies have found that certain parasitic species can reduce symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, type one diabetes, and arthritis humans living in a sterile world isn't very good for us, especially when we're then affected by something we're not used to and our body goes into overdrive. And having parasites helps prevent this from happening. And so therefore, we're less likely to have allergic reactions if we're parasitised. In some cases, it's not 100% of the time. Anyway, because of some of the correlations which scientists have found, helminthic therapy is being looked into still. This leads us on to the last conversation point of this podcast, and that is, what would the world be like without parasites? In a paper by Wood and Johnson, they concluded that the world would be a very different place without parasites, but not necessarily just for the obvious reasons. Humans have managed to make only two parasite species extinct, the condor louse, by accident, and variola, which causes smallpox. This was done in 1980, and it's obviously a good thing, as smallpox killed 500 million people in just 100 years. Many studies have found that the extinction of parasites would reduce mortality in humans, reduce poverty in humans, lead to less disability, increased agricultural production, lead to more successful wildlife conservation, and a better quality and welfare of human life. Eradication of some species of parasites may also cause a boom in the population of its hosts, and that is in the hosts where the parasites hold them back in some way, prevent them from breeding or cause many of them to die, for example. And this then affects their relationship with their predators, with their prey, 
or even as humans if they themselves are deemed as pests? And here's an example. The parasite-infected periwinkle snail, which lives in New England, consumes less algae than uninfected individuals of periwinkle snail, which means that areas of infected periwinkle snails are a much better habitat for other species which use this algae for habitat or for food. In New Zealand mudflats, larval trematodes increase their intertidal diversity by affecting bivalves and therefore any organisms which use their shells as a habitat. Here's another way in which parasites have an effect on their hosts. Invasive species sometimes outcompete native species because their new habitat lacks the host specific parasites to infect them, which makes them outcompete the native species due to being fitter. But this can also work the other way around, so species which can tolerate a parasite they're used to may outcompete the new species which cannot, or the new species may introduce a parasite which the native species cannot tolerate in the same way. Parasites affect the likelihood of predators feeding on prey so as to continue their life cycle, like toxoplasmosis. And so therefore, it can be said to strengthen the stability of food chains, but can also weaken them in different ways as well, conversely. Wood and Johnson, who I spoke about earlier, predicted that a world without parasites would be a world with fewer predators and other processes which affect their surroundings would also be impacted. Parasite-mediated behavioural changes can cause trophic cascade. If a parasite causes their host to move to an area they wouldn't usually be in and therefore into a new ecosystem, a predator who lives in that ecosystem and which doesn't usually encounter this host may then eat the host and it might become part of their diet. This then means their usual prey species suddenly increases in number and flourishes and therefore eats more of their usual prey or whatever plant matter they usually eat, which results, as I said, in a trophic cascade. Is the world a better place for having parasites? I'll let you draw your own conclusion, Kev. I personally would say definitely not. An article written in the BBC in 2015 did say, surprisingly, a world without parasites might not be a nicer one, but when you think of some of the absolutely horrific things that parasites do to people, I can't sit here and say, I'm glad that parasites exist, even if there are positives to their existence. I'm actually going to say, I think the world is a better place with parasites. I'm going to go the opposite way to you on this, because there's tens of thousands, if not probably even more, parasites in the world, and they all do their own little bit for the ecosystems. Like you said about that one that alters a, a part of the host, which then makes the ecosystem around them flourish. That's a positive. And I'm, I'm going to take it from a non-human perspective, even though they do f affect us too, and say, yeah, I think parasites are good for the planet. If they weren't, then they wouldn't be a part of the ecosystem. You say that, but just because the planet would be wildly different without parasites, that doesn't necessarily mean it would be bad. And although you discuss some parasites causing some places to flourish in different ways, they also hold species and therefore ecosystems back largely as well. And they cause so much suffering, which if parasites didn't exist, maybe wouldn't occur as much. But then also the animal which is predating the, the host of these parasites, their species are going to do really well. It's, there's so many parasites in the world affecting different species on so many different levels I think it's an integral part of of nature the, the cycle of life and the ecosystems I think without parasites the world wouldn't be the same as we know it now I completely agree with you but we're not talking about whether it be the same or not we're talking about whether it be good or not and that's why I wanted this podcast to be about importance rather than good versus bad because yeah. I think we can both agree that parasites are very important and have a huge impact on the way that the world and nature is Yep, yeah, I'm pro-parasite and I do think they're very, very important in our world. A lot of people will probably not agree with that, but that's, f I mean, from what I've learned from this podcast myself, and I've learned a lot, I love doing these podcasts because I learn things all the time, um, I think they play maybe more of a positive than a negative in, in the world. Well, whether we think parasites are good or not as a whole, at least we can agree that they're important. And simply by that, we just mean they affect everything and they're big and they're bigger than we probably give them credit for. Parasites aren't just affecting people in other countries who have horrible diseases because of them. They're affecting all of us every day and the life we live. And even the economy, from what we found out. 
I'll tell you what, let's let our listeners think this one over. Or at least they think they are the ones thinking this over. If they've got a parasite in their brain. Maybe it's a parasite deciding for you. 